It is uh, Thursday morning, cliffcentral.com, and you are here with us live today. We're going to talk to Gabriel Krause in a moment, as well as Lito Ndoba, and both of them are no strangers to the burning platform. This morning, uh, Pumi couldn't make it, but we'll have her back. And Kansen sent me a message just to say, um, even though he's not on the burning platform regularly anymore, he will make a, a re- uh, what, do you, what do you want to call it, a reappearance because um, he wants to do the I told you so thing when it comes to prescribed assets, because it turns out, as Canton has been warning us for months, that government is indeed coming after your pension. So just in case you're one of those people who went, oh, no, that was just alarmism. Um, the ANC and, and, and the ANC and government have no intention of grabbing hold of people's hard-earned pensions in order to bail out things like ESCOM. No, that's um, that's an urban legend. Well, turns out it isn't such an urban legend. They are going hook, line, and sinker for your prescribed assets. The money that you save every month that you've already been taxed on is going into the ANC's dirty, filthy clutches soon. So don't for a moment think that when we warn you about these things, there isn't a you know, a fair amount of thought that's gone into it, especially because we have to be responsible for what we say. And Canton wants to come back and do a big, I told you so. So that's going to happen soon. All right. So let me introduce you to Lito and Doba and to Gabriel Krauser. As I said, both of them are uh, very familiar to people who listen to the Burning Platform. But just in case you don't know, Lito is a lecturer at the Central University of Technology, a debater and a sociopolitical analyst. Hey, Lito, how are you, man? Good morning, Gareth. I'm good in yourself. Good to see you, dude. And Gabriel Krauser, who's a writer and analyst at the Institute of Race Relations. And both of you have also been on the TV show. So it's great to see you both again. Uh, First of all, thanks for waking up early this morning to talk about things that irritate us, because that's really what the burning platform has become, more or less. And we have plenty of those to talk about today. Let's start off, guys, if you don't mind, with the vaccine rollout. I'm really trying very hard to not be a cynical, uh, miserable harpy about this i have very little very little faith in our government being able to deliver on this this uh, vaccine front and i I, it's not about the we know that they didn't order on time we know that uh, some of these vaccines have very particular conditions that they have to be kept up i believe this astrazeneca one which is the one that we've got now is it needs to be kept at like minus four degrees which is not as as arduous a task as trying to keep something at minus 70 but the Department of Health, which, of course, is responsible for our state hospitals, it's responsible for, um, for, for, for running the basic healthcare needs of, of the nation, doesn't do a terrific job, uh, even on a good day. And Zuelim Kize, for all the things that people say about him being an able administrator and, uh, and a guy whose heart's in the right place and who's not a fool and he's no you know, complete idiot when it comes to medicine. He's actually one rare, rare for cabinet. This guy's actually qualified um, for the portfolio, which he runs. But I don't have a whole lot of faith here. And I, I, I'm hoping either of you will maybe give me a glimmer of hope or that you'll just join the bandwagon of what most of our listeners this morning seem to think is an impossible dream that the health department in South Africa will be able to hand out these vaccines and get more than 50% of us inoculated against this virus what do you think lito you go you can go first um so i i have to agree with everyone else right um you i had the hope i had the hopefulness inside me to say okay maybe something might happen here right but if you think about it so if you're in a poor area because that's where i live right i live in a very very in a piss poor area so if you're here your whole province is poor let's be honest exactly so Let's take let's take the free state for example, right? If you are in Botabelo, if you are in Virginia, if you are in Kronstadt, if you are in Bethlehem, those are places without a major hospital and no and no major medical facilities. So if right. you have to keep something at minus four, it basically means you're gonna have to put it in the fridges and taverns. That's the only place where you can keep it, right? They're gonna have to go up taverns for that. And so, and, and, and unfortunately, thanks to lockdown, a lot of the taverns have gone out of business. Of course. So probably that was the whole mission, right? And get them out of business, get the beers out and get the vaccines in. Because because when you think about it, and then they say there's an online system that has to put you on a list. 
Mm. Whenever you tell somebody from a poor area about a government list, that's where you lose me totally, right? Because as, as soon as you put a list in front of government, that's yeah. where they lose the whole plot. Because let me show you just like an example of how bad they are with lists. There are people who are still on a list from 1994 for housing. 1994, they're still on the same list waiting for a house. So if you're going to have a list for this, it means if you're in a poor area, if you're in a rural area, if you are not, if you don't have the capabilities to go and register online, then what? If if then what? What's going to happen? How's the how is this and uh, um, um, this um, vaccine going to get to you? And also the mismanagement of these facilities. Let's not forget that, right? Um, mm -hmm. if you go to to the yeah. regional hospital here in 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 Valcom, based in Valcom, people have gone to that hospital going for a toe operation and left without a hand. So, what do you do then? Well, Gabriel, I, I watched with interest when Cyril and uh, and and uh, listen, everybody had to go. Uh, Didi Mabuza was there, Cyril was there, and uh, Zuelim Kize was there to to collect the vaccine from the airport. As I said on the TV show last night, the last time an ANC sent a delegate, the ANC sent a delegation like this to an airport was when the Guptas had their wedding. But <laughs> they, they took they took delivery of this. Um, it was a big propaganda move, you know. Look, the delivery of this great vaccine, which is going to save South Africa. But I couldn't help noticing in the faces of those caters who were gathered around that there was the same look that you see on hungry people's faces at a wedding or a funeral where the food is for free. And I couldn't help thinking, I have a suspicion that just like everything else that the government control, they're going to see to themselves first. And if we're lucky and we're, we're not, you know, most of us are not card carrying members of the ANC. If we're lucky, we may see this thing much, much further down the line. But of course, it's it's okay to be cynical about these guys because their track record gives us no evidence to the contrary, right? Yeah, no, I think that is unfortunately right. Um, we one way to see how dire the situation is is to play the counterfactual, where you assume that the ANC that the government rolls out this vaccine as fast as it's promised to, right? Yeah. Well, that's extremely slowly. That would put us right at the, you know, bottom end of world rollout. And significantly, South Africa has developed, as far as uh, the best scientists can tell, the most um, potently mutated strain of SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. Why that is, is somewhat un unclear. But something that bugs me about media coverage of the South African strain or 501YV2 is that a lot of journalists don't seem to have read the paper which identifies the cardinal characteristics of 501YV2. In that paper, they say why we need to ask ourselves in the discussion section, why did this mutant strain develop here? And they kind of float two hypotheses. The one mm -hmm. hypothesis is to do with long incubation periods. The longer a virus has to live in a particular body. Um, the more chance it has to mutate inside that body. So if you've got a very immunosuppressed population, a lot of people with HIV, is their speculation, that might contribute to it. But then they say, look, we've actually done tests on this, and so far the tests are all coming out negative in terms of that hypothesis coming out right. It doesn't look like the, the virus actually incubates for longer. So what is it then? So the second hypothesis is that uh, the virus was so prevalent by late spring last year or spring last year that there was uh, what they call a population level stress for selection for selecting uh, escape mutations so basically we were it looks like and and this hypothesis they don't produce sort of contrary evidence they they sort of are left with saying basically this is what fits what we know at the moment best is that the virus spread faster here basically than anywhere else nationwide i mean there were cities that definitely spread faster but in terms of a whole country getting a, a, a very large population it spread here faster than anywhere else uh you reach a significant portion of the population being infected and now the virus in order to uh outcompete different versions of itself is really contesting to be able to get around immuno responses and those immuno that was then fully uh pushed the, the evidence mounted further when you look at the um, studies on vaccine efficacy, which is substantially reduced for our virus, not substantially reduced for um, the UK strain and so on. So, I mean, that's not to say people shouldn't be taking vaccines. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. But it is to say 
the turnaround time for getting a next gen virus that sort of substantially knocks your immune system's ability once you've recovered to stop you from getting it again or knocks the vaccine's ability to stop you from uh, getting it and transferring to others took about eight months uh, mm. with the South African level spread. That also lines up, by the way, with the most well-studied coronavirus, which is 229E, which the, is the common cold. And the Brits have been studying very rigorously what? since 2000 and since the 1950s. That what? also has an eight-month turnaround time. So if we take a whole year, we'll have a third-generation virus by, by late winter, which will make our current vaccines even less efficient. And if you look at the rate that we're planning to roll out the vaccines, that's what we're planning for. That's like the best case scenario we're looking at right now. And, and, it, and it, it's toxic for South Africa. It's toxic for the world. And, the, and the, 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 the biologists that I've been speaking to and the numbers that I've been running make me think SARS-CoV-2, given South Africa's way of playing this, is going to outlive all three of us. We, we, we're giving it so much rope to keep evolving. It's like the tortoise and the hare. It keeps staying ahead. If we, if we roll out the vaccine so slowly, the virus keeps getting an extra chance yeah. to, to play around in the virgin population and reinfect some of the inoculated population. And, and, and that's all it needs uh, to, to stay ahead of the curve. Now, does that mean it'll stay as deadly? No. Um, but it does mean that we, we seem to have already been the Petri dish for evolving the most toxic form of SARS-CoV-2 in the world. And like our plan is to is to hold on to that bit of South African exceptionalism. In other words, we are going to be the place that keeps developing new strains. Yeah, that we're That's cutting true. edge. We are cutting edge. <laughs> and we're gonna be and we're gonna be playing catch up in terms of the vaccine forever. This is not good. Um, this is a lot more cynical and it's a it, it's a lot more frightening than than what I was talking about just in terms of vaccine delivery. But if I can, we're going to pause that part of the conversation because we've spent a few minutes on it already. And Gabriel, thank you. A lot of that stuff was completely new information to me. I don't know about you, Lito, but that, I mean, that's really um, quite arresting stuff. I do want to talk, speak of arresting, uh, talk about something political because that this is what we do on the Burning Platform. It's brought to you by Nando's. By the way, if you haven't been uh, paying attention, uh, they've been part of this show from the very outset and uh we continue to tackle some of the political things that that i suppose the mainstream media are trying to avoid a lot of the time and in this case ace machashul is saying to us we should pay no attention and leave jacob zuma alone in this big fight that we're seeing over the the constitutional court <laughs> under commission trying to get the guy to comply now what do you two think of this the state capture commission saying that they're laying another uh, criminal complaint against Jacob Zuma. The Constitutional Court come out and supported them. Uh, in fact, they've said that Judge Zondo was, was maybe a little too soft on him even. And I don't think that that's the case. Judge Zondo has been, I think, fairly objective in all of this. But what do you two make of uh, former president, and especially of Ace Machashule saying just this morning that we should leave him alone? Um, so let me start with this. So um, I, I laughed so hard because uh, Jacob Zuma is – is the best, right? We have to say that. I mean, Stalingrad approach till the wheels fall off. Like, chase me to the end of the earth. Mm -hmm. I will not come in and help you arrest me. Never, right? I think he gave that advice to Dudu Mieni. Dudu went there and he said, ah, Dudu, you didn't, you didn't do well. You didn't do justice by what I told you to do. Because at the end of the day, this is basically what he's saying. He's saying, going to, to pay a fine for contempt of court or going to jail for six months, it's better than 27 years. I'm not going to do it, right? That's what he's saying to the rest of us. But further inside the ANC, right, is the 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 biggest like cock up you've ever seen of a party. Right now, it's it's imploding. It's the party is literally eating itself alive. Ace Mahashule comes in and says, "Ah, no, ignore the the." The, the, the constitution, and he even makes a comparison. Oh, you guys let uh, you didn't allow uh, you didn't say anything when an apartheid person didn't go to didn't go to the um what do you call didn't go to the commission. I said um to to the TRC. I mean, and so he was like, you're comparing your leader to an apartheid person. So yeah. at the end of the day, what we're going to see is because even like the other thing we're ignoring is that Cyril Ramaphosa must go and appear. 
at the state capture commission. So the most dangerous thing that's going to happen there is in these nine wasted years, you are also there, Mr. President, Mr. Savior from the sky who is going to stop corruption. You are watching while all of these happen. And at worst, when Brian Mulefe says he was, he was part of the corruption as well. So now we're going to see that the ANC is a part of the worst versus the worst, right? And so now the problem is where to from here? Because South Africa is going to be in a panic mood. We have never been in a situation where we all admitted, oh, well, this party is trash. And that's where it's going. We're, we're now seeing the ANC being laid naked, being laid bare. And by the way, let's not forget, Jacob Zuma warned us. He said, hey, guys, let me just narrow this, co uh, this commission and its, in its view down. Because if we say state capture, we're just going to blow everything up. And so now, you know, Ace Makashule is the willing henchman war leader, right? Ace Makashule, the way he took over the, the free state is exactly what he does. He, he does not care for a bit. He's not going to deviate from the message. He doesn't care who insults. I'm telling you now, Terra Likota to this day probably still has nightmares about how he was kicked out of the free state by Isma Khashoggi. And so it's, it's a very bad situation for the ANC, but an even worse position for, for South Africa. Because unfortunately, none of the opposition parties have stepped up. You see, if any opposition party steps up now, the ANC is gone from leadership almost forever. Yeah, and there's there's a significant opportunity for them, but uh, you know they're all they're all just kind of waiting in the wings and hoping something will happen. And this is always what happens: is people are so focused on the ANC or the the Kasatu ANC SACP alliance that they don't gain the ground that they should be gaining from the ANC's failure. Or do you think we're being unfair? I mean, Gabriel. You know, you, you deal with uh, the, the opposition parties quite a lot when you do your research for the IRR and you're paying attention to what people on the ground are saying. Uh, are, are most people just opting out of the system? Because that's been the case for the last 10 to 15 years. You know, if they can't get the ANC to do what they want, then they just stop participating. Yeah, so I think that's uh, clearly borne out by the evidence. Uh, in the last, in the 2019 election, one in four South Africans voted for the ANC. If you go back to 2004, um, which was a sort of peak election, you had uh, more than half of the country voting for the ANC. So there's a whole quarter that of the country, you know, huge numbers that voted for them and then were like, ah, I don't know that I can vote for someone else, but I'm definitely not voting for them. Uh, and that is uh, what political scientists would call an opportunity. Um, but it's not one that's been capitalized on. I think that uh, the EFF has done uh, really well. I expected them to to be having a poorer showing than they did in the most recent uh, 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 polls. Um, they they popularity seems to continue to grow. Uh, the DA's has uh, grown again from its, uh, its sort of slide into 2019. And one has to see whether or not the changes in leadership and in attitude uh, will in time uh, bite. But I think that the, the problem with corruption is that at some stage, you, you reach a tipping point where people say, look, these, this is the rule of the game. Uh, it's eat or be eaten. And frankly, yeah. you're naive if you're hoping or planning for anything else. And so you've got to opt in, even if you don't like it, even if you sort of morally hold yourself a little bit above it. Like this is the only way that I can guarantee myself uh, an income or hold on to my assets or get my vaccine or whatever is to, is to show, uh, is to show that I care, is to show that I'm a real loyalist, is not to complain, is not to make loud noises um, and a wailing and gnashing of teeth. And when I do make loud noises to kind of blame the system in an opaque, esoteric, vague way and not to go after particular solvable problems. And I think that a lot of South Africans are starting to feel uh, distressed enough by the combination of increased joblessness and uh, poor prospects going forward. Treasury reckons we'll only get back to our, it's Treasury's own forecast that we only get to our GDP peak in twenty our 2013 GDP pick in the 2030s. So I think a lot of people look at that and they start thinking, well, maybe it's a fool's game to do anything yeah. but support the ANC. 
uh, because they're the king, right? And when if you're under a, an absolute ruler, you've got to bow and scrape and say, please, master, can I have some crumbs? So here's the, here's the question, and both of you are uniquely placed to answer it. How much worse does it get before it gets better? And what is the breaking point for the ANC? I mean, Lito, both you and, and Gabriel seem of a, of, of a single mind, and I know you two would probably disagree about a lot of things. You're those kinds of people. You're, you're nuanced. But the ANC is in tatters, but it's still there, and it's still the biggest party in the country. And are we getting the government we deserve? When is going to be the point where people go enough? And what will it take? Well, so for me, it's very simple. The poor have been complaining about the ANC service delivery and all of these things for a very, very long time. They've yeah. stayed discontented. and everybody just ignored them. It was just like, ah, they're poor people. They're always unhappy, right? So the biggest issue is the middle class and sort of the upper class people have to get to a point where they are so disgusted that they have to confront themselves, their biases, and they, they need to be a little bit better than the poor. Right? Because at the moment, the middle class and the upper class people haven't thought about what it would be like if it all came down and they were as poor as the others. Right? They always think that the system is a little bit better because at least I'm not living in a shed. That's what everybody tells themselves. Yeah, so correct. now the issue is the, the, the parties as they exist now, the political parties who could capitalize on this or probably make something better, is that the EFF is just focusing on the poor. They're just saying, hey, guys, you see you've been left in the state. We're the only ones that care. The right. DA is focusing only on the middle class and saying, hey, guys, you see we're here to protect you and whatever wealth you have from being poor. And so now there is no concerted effort to make sure that everyone in society understands mm -hmm. that they have so much to lose with the failure of the ANC. Now, the failure of the ANC has not been connected to South Africa. It's been connected to this like clown show that they're putting on inside the ANC. So we all love to point and laugh at the ANC, but none of us are willing to admit that the ANC crashing is the country crashing because that's what they've become. They've, they've, like, they've become this embodiment of what the country is. And so for now, what I, what I think is best to happen is the implosion of the ANC should happen fast so that everyone must know how bad it gets. So that we can, because South Africa is not talent, is not like devoid of talent to the point at which we can't raise an economy after the ANC messes it up completely. I think that's the only way, right? Once yeah. the ANC crashes, the rats leave the ship, and then we start building from scratch. You agree, Gabriel? Yeah, I, I mean, I think something like that must be right. To to bring in the race element, I think that the ANC owns the narrative, right? It's, 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 there's a classic problem across countries where you have maladministration, where it's like, well, the problem is bad government. So the solution is more government. And that is, that's, that's the mentality of an addict. Um, but we are addicted to the ANC in that way in this country. We sort of like the problem, you know, and this was the pitch for Ramaphosa, like the problem is the ANC, but now I've got a new leader. So, we need more ANC and we need to give them a stronger mandate in order for them to have the confidence that they need. Otherwise, they're going to be too shy and insecure. But if we really make them feel confident, like we still love you guys, yeah. then they'll be able to introspect and get rid of the bad elements and bring forward the good elements and, and, and go up like that. And I think the reason part of the, the tick uh, or the, that, that we have uh, in, 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 in our addiction to the ANC is this thought that they are the strongest and only real guardians, powerful enough to resist the forces of white monopoly capital, to resist the forces of apartheid ghosts that lurk in the machine and that would, if given an opportunity, rise up and um, repress the majority of the country on the basis of the color of their skin. And that plays out in a million different ways. And, you know, it's clearly borne out by our, our surveys, the, the priority that our survey participants uh, show uh, for, for sort of based nationalist policies like expropriation without compensation or combating decolonization, you know, punting decolonization is extremely low. Um, at the same time, you've got a uh, very high priority for jobs and crime and corruption. At the same time, you have a lot of people saying, look, the country has been going in a much worse direction. 
but a lot of people still approve for the ANC. So I think they, I think when things go wrong, they uh, have a ready uh, card to play, which is either this is apartheid's fault or it's some lurking ghost that lingers on. Um, and that idea, as much as many South Africans don't seem to buy into it fully in private, in the public arena, race mm. is such a difficult thing to talk about. You get so slammed if you counter the narrative. Uh, you get so easily uh, shamed and ostracized that the, that the idea doesn't get political traction. And so I think things are going to have to get, I, you know, I think things are getting worse. And I think that at some point, it, it might be the case that they're so bad that we become fed up once again. As we sort of started to get fed up uh, with Zuma in 2017, we get fed up with these excuses of white monopoly capital and start saying, you know, we can't wind back the clock, but what we can do is vote you out. And, uh, well, and we're going to address the problems that we can solve. And at that point, um, maybe things change, but uh, maybe not. Like there is this, there is this um, uh, worst case scenario where people, as things get worse, become more anxious and more paranoid and mm. more enclaved and uh, more violent. And that uh, that doesn't breed a sober situation. The, the worst race no. nationalist regimes only get to do the worst once the sort of body politic suffers even more than we're suffering right now relative to where they've been. So it's not a guarantee. Getting worse is not a guarantee. It's it's a chance, but not a guarantee of improvement. Yeah, I certainly hope you're you're wrong about it getting worse. I certainly hope I'm wrong about it getting worse since I posited that in the first place. But Ndokozo says... Uh, <laughs> Dogoza says, I don't want it to get really bad first. We need to find a different solution. <laughs> I suppose everybody feels that way too. You know, let's let's not lose what we have, which is not a lot. And, you know, I heard uh, on, on one of the TV shows last night, I heard someone saying that uh, tax is the tax base is drying up. You know, those super wealthy people that the ANC keeps talking about, there are only a handful of them and most of their wealth is actually overseas already. And in places that the ANC can't get to it. Um, I was saying at the beginning of the show this morning that Canton has been banging a drum for three years about how the ANC is coming to take your pensions, your hard earned savings, money that people have put away, probably because they absolutely had to and they had to be very disciplined to do that. Money that has already been taxed, um, money which they hope will keep them at a certain standard of living and not in poverty when they're very old one day. And these prescribed assets are now a target. And the ANC has made it very clear that they are keen to turn these prescribed assets into a, a, a slush fund for bailing out things like ESCOM, which is only in the situation it's in because it's been mismanaged by the same ANC. So I feel that, that for many people, uh, this might be, uh, for those people that you're talking about, Lito, this might be the step that eventually makes them go, hang on, what? this is money that isn't yours that now you're going to take that I've already paid you tax on. How the fuck dare you? This is not acceptable. Can we turn our attention internationally? I read a story this morning in the news about Davos um, and their 2021 summit, which has been postponed um, to August and is going to be held in Singapore rather than in the Swiss Alps. How relevant are the people who go to Davos anymore. These are the same people who have mismanaged the pandemic across the world. These are the same people who keep on telling us that they know better than we do and have see, have been seen as the emperors without clothes um, as this, uh, this coronavirus has rolled out through, throughout the world. None of them have covered themselves in glory. None of them seem to have had a very good handle on things. Um, all of them seem to be parroting the same kind of stuff of, you know, kind of we can get back to where we were before and just trust us. We know what we're doing. They don't. These people who go to Davos are, in essence, the elite that are the enemy of the people at the opposite end of the narrative to what most people believe. How long can things like Davos continue to exist? How can the World Economic Forum continue to tell ordinary people in the world that everything's okay? When it's okay for them, but not for us. Um, I, I like that idea. Like you see, Davos is, is this huge circle jerk of people who have money, right? They all go there and they touch each other's boobies and think it's all good. 
Because if you think about it, like I, I, I watched um, a very cringy interview they did with Paul Kagame on in Davos. Paul Kagame is, is actually making strides in his in, in his economy and trying to help the people of, of his country out. They got there and they basically they all all that lady in that interview needed to say is dance monkey, right? Because at the end of the day, we there's this belief, especially in poorer countries, that we can go to Davos and our fortunes can change. We can go dance for some master, he'll get us um, some money and we'll be better. But at the end of the day, it's you know, it, it is poverty porn for the rich. They don't they don't want to come to the slums anymore, they don't want to come to Kailich and point at poor people. So they go to Davos yep. and point at poor presidents and say, ah, look at Silver and his poor country and his failing SAA. Because at the end of the day, what where the fortunes of any country lie. And, you know, we, we can point all over the world, but China showed this. The fortunes of your country lie with the investment in your people and their capabilities. If you raise those up, you're going to raise that country up. Instead of doing that, our president and his, and his people and Tito Mboweni take their ugly shoes and their ugly cooking and they get on a plane and they get to Davos and they go and beg, Right. Which is what is expected of Africa anyway. Uh, they'll come here and they'll beg for what they what they need. Right. Instead of staying here and working out a, a feasible plan, not the stupid NDP that they've worked out that's like a basically a wish list and not really anything that will take us anywhere. Right? So the biggest problem what we need what we need in, in these African countries is to make a plan with the people that you have. So you have an uneducated poor population. How do you create a vocational sector with factories that is going to create the kind of things that we often um, um, import? How do we get those down and get ourselves to be more competitive in this Africa Free Trade Agreement, for instance, that we signed, right? But we're not doing that. We're saying, oh, we have a poor, um, uneducated population. So you know what? Let's give them 350 rand. That will probably get us where, where, we, where we need. Yeah. And so. And and a t-shirt every four years. Of course. And and I promise that we'll keep we'll keep the grants up, right? Mm. And I think that's the problem, is that we're not making plans for the population we have. We're making plans for the population we wish we had, right? Um, we wish to have this country full of mathematicians and engineers. What we need to do is to make a plan for the people we have, and then we'll start to see growth in a way that is substantial, both to people and the country. Then all of the the the, the the big kahunas that come from Davos will automatically come. We have to build it, then they'll come. We don't have to go there and ask them to build it for us. What do you think, Gabriel? Yeah, it's, I, I, I like the way you put that. I mean, I, I, I think that I think therein li, di, does lie uh, the best prospect for growth. I do think that Davos will remain relevant because of the power that its attendees wield. I think that it's quite smart of them to have moved from the West to the East in this case, because you're, you said about no one covering themselves in glory in, in the plague of 2020. I'm not sure that I agree. Singapore has performed well. South Korea has performed well. Taiwan, and especially of note Vietnam, whose GDP is about a third or half of South Africa's, has performed extremely forget, well. And don't forget China, who not only gave us this virus, but has also made uh, the only growth in terms of, of uh, where the baseline economy was at the beginning of 2020. They're the only country in the world that has actually grown. And, and we yeah. know that that's, that's cynical. I don't want to give them credit because I like them. I want to give them credit because I think they've manipulated things. No, I think they have, but 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 the, uh, the other East Asian countries, some of them which are quite free. I mean, I think Vietnam uh, is is an interesting comparison to China because it's also sort of run by a one-party communist elite, but at the same time, uh, sort of wasn't uh, bolting people into their apartments and generally has a better uh, record on uh, civil liberties than than Beijing's China does. And Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea. I mean, they had strong economic performance and very, very low viral repression. I was talking to um, an epidemiologist in Switzerland, Geneva, who said, here's a fact that I wish everyone was talking about. Vietnam, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, 
outperformed Belgium when it comes to death per population by 4,000, by a factor of 4,000, 4,000 fewer deaths. And their economy grew too, uh, not, as, not, as, not as robustly as China's, but they, but they achieved, uh, at least on the figures that I saw, positive GDP. But, so Gabriel, so I, I think I, that the, the elites I'm in the sad. East, I'm just trying to say I the think, elites in the East are not totally screwed up. Eh? Okay, I, I agree with you, and I'm very glad that you brought up those examples because I, I gloss over them. When I think of Davos, though, I don't think of those, the leader of Vietnam or the leader of Singapore. Unfortunately, I think those people are kind of on the, on the, the next tier down from the people who actually manage things at Davos. And none of those people have done extremely well. I think all of us can agree that. Yeah, of yeah course. I think that's right. But I also think that if you look at, if, if you look at wealth, if you look at um, – uh, it, it, there's a very nice picture which has like the world's GDP on a map, the sort of center of gravity. If you take every uh, city's GDP, every country's GDP, and then you, you give them a weighted average, you see where's the center of gravity. And it was hovering around uh, between the UK and the Netherlands for the longest time. And it's just been tracking east and east and east. And Davos is about one thing above all others, and that's money. And as yeah. the money has moved further east, uh, the, the bankers in Hong Kong and the resort managers in Macau and the entrepreneurs in South Korea have become more and more relevant. And it is true that there's a lag between their, their real power and wealth growing and their kudos or prestige or, or the, the attention that they deserve being redirected towards them. But, but I think uh, Davos is in a way showing... Uh, an effort to catch up in that regard by pushing it that side. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more attention going to, to far Eastern leaders, uh, both business leaders and political leaders at this time, because they're going to have a lot to brag about short of some kind of disaster. Um, they're going to be able to say, look, here's the difference between us and you. We've done well. We've, we have what you want. Um, and that is, that's hard, you know. That's a that you you can bluster and you can and you can puff your chest out as much as you want if you're in the UK or the US or, or Switzerland. Um, it's going to be hard to show up to that meeting and 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 not lift your hat and say, "Look, guys, we want to learn. We you have what we want. We want to learn how you did it." Well, I think uh, Raleigh makes a very good synopsis of, of both of your points of view. Uh, he says, "I completely agree. If you don't make stuff, you won't have stuff." Yeah, <laughs> I think you should have had Riley on the show. You would have had spent us up a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's very succinct. Right. So, gentlemen, um, th there are lots of other things on the agenda, but it wouldn't be a burning platform without quickly referring to the United States, and we've got uh, a few minutes to do that. How's Joe Biden doing, and what do you think is happening over there at the moment? Is it this return to normal that the Democrats promised before the election? Uh, why is Donald Trump so quiet? Is it just because he doesn't have a Twitter account anymore? And what do you think Joe Biden's policy priorities are? Um, so, firstly, Donald Trump is just quiet, I think, because one, he's worried about this whole second impeachment thing. But secondly, is because he's trying to find out how he can best master his energies and whatever he has left to move forward. I think that's what, where he is right now. Secondly, Joe Biden, um, I think his policy positions, firstly, is to just reverse some of like the the trash things that um, um, Donald Trump has made, like like the obviously trash stuff. Um, renegotiate NAFTA, especially when it comes to Canada and its and its um, dairy um, proposition to America, um, and then um, basically un, undo the the stupid things like keeping the children in cages at the border, all of those things. But then said, and then thirdly. I think he wants to fulfill the burdens that um, Donald Trump couldn't, right? I'm getting the Midwest to work again. I'm putting Central Americans, so like the people in Middle America back to work and sort of like getting the Rust Belt back and all of that infrastructural development. But and then a lot of... He's, all he's done in his first few days is exactly the opposite. He's cut jobs because of energy concerns over climate change. He's, he's decimated some 50,000 jobs in his first five days in office. So I don't know about the Rust Belt loving what he's up to at the moment. Yes, but remember, he also has to dance to, to the Native Americans through the pipelines 
um, land, they run through their land, right? So he had to do that little song and dance shuffle, right? Um, so because you, you can't you can't do that, you can't still be saying the Native Americans must bend over when you have Kamala Harris, who's apparently the um, Middle Eastern, black, white, colored, whatever person that she is, right? So you yeah. can't. So you, you can't be Joe Biden and winner for the ticket that he did and not challenge things like the energy concerns and the pipelines running through native lands, right? But yeah, but, I, but then but then what you know, these two things can't both be true at the same time, I'm afraid. Either you're all for jobs and you care about middle class Americans, which is what Joe was trying to pander to while he was running for uh, for office, um, or you don't. And if you don't, you do what he's just done, which is to decimate jobs in the Midwest. But he's trying to bring. They're going to try to bring them back through the 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 not all of the them. Green New Don't Deal. Open your mouth yeah, yeah. No, the yeah. Green New Deal. Okay. They're going to try to go the Green New Deal route without the Alexandra Ocasio Cortez um, elbowing you in the mouth every time, right? So it's it's they're going to try to have like this weird balancing act because yeah. that's what they ran on. Because um, sort of the people of color are going to be saying, "Hey, guy, we we voted you in, and this woman, and My, so yeah. now." Deliver. My, my my simplified uh, version of that is is instead of of pipelines, we'll give you pipe dreams. What do you oh. think, Gabriel? Oh, very good, well put. Yeah, I think that 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 Joe Biden did run on an impossible ticket. Um, that's politics. It's an auction of promises, and his early administration has shown which promises it's willing to keep and which promises it's willing to break. Uh, the promises it's been willing to break have been to uh, the Rust Belt to America's middle class. I think that Donald Trump is quiet because um, Melania has a leash on him uh, or like a <laughs> one of those balls, like a gimp ball. That's I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I think this is all very funny, but I, we're talking about a guy who, Lito, you said earlier, he's, he's sitting there licking his wounds and he's afraid of impeachment. This guy's not afraid of impeachment. We know that for a fact because he yeah. wasn't afraid of the first impeachment. Um, if anything, Donald Trump could give two shits about this stuff. That's one thing for sure about him. And I, I'm just, I'm concerned that maybe the reason that we're not hearing so much is by design. This may be the first time that Donald Trump's actually decided to shut up. And that makes me a little bit nervous. And it yeah, no. Democrats nervous. Right. I think it should. I think that um, uh, on a show that I did with you last week, uh, Uh, Gabriel? Sorry, Gabriel, we lost you for Hi. a second. Say that again. Phone, I just got an interruption there. Um, okay. What is, what is history going to think of Donald Trump? I think the answer is that he's sort of a combination between the Dark Knight from Batman and, and a wrecking ball of Miley Cyrus. Uh, because he sort of came <laughs> in as the kind of hero that that breaks the rules and that's what you love about him and he's a kind of bad guy but he's also a wrecking ball whose very purpose is to be a force of nature that kind of destroys the artifice of the elite and he swung through the democratic party he kind of he won when it seemed to be impossible and he drove a lot of the mad uh when that seemed almost to be desirable but there's been the backswing and in the backswing he's been destroying the republican party more than anything else right and i think he has matured to the point where he appreciates that his best chance at returning to power, which does, which I think is his uh, ambition would be to preserve the Republican party to a degree, um, either to run against as a third party candidate against a version of it that he can say, look, I tried to save you guys and I tried not to break you guys. And now I'm going to replace you guys or to say, look, I want to come back and take over and, and run in 2023. I think that he realized he was doing more harm than good after the Capitol Hill breach. And, and it does seem like a political calculation to stay quiet now. Let the Democrats make the mistake. That's one thing Trump never did. He never sort of shut up for long enough for other people to embarrass themselves. He was always the yeah. pig getting in the trough and wrestling around. And uh, he got so filthy that, he, that if, if he wants to uh, go back to power, which I believe he really does, he's got to be quiet. Um, for a while, and the and the sooner he talks again, I think the less chance he has of re-election. So if he if he 
starts yapping around Easter. Um, I think one can safely say Donald Trump, not safely, uh, but the, the, I'd be really well, worried been- if he hasn't said anything by Christmas. If he hasn't said anything by Christmas, then I'm going to uh, – I'm sure my American friends are going to start getting very excited about the Donald Trump presidency in 2024. Yeah, and and I think also this impeachment thing isn't going to go anywhere because for conviction they don't have the votes. So it's going to be this is real it's pure theater, and it's what the Democrats are good at. It's all about their emotions. That what they're doing is they're trying to. I mean, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez uh, put out this hugely emotional Instagram feed the other day where she talked about how the the attack on the Capitol uh, affected her personally. And, you know, as a victim of, uh, I think she said as a victim of, of sexual um, molestation or whatever it was, it reminded her of, you know, a near death experience that she'd had when she was um, sexually violated once before. And I mean, it's all about emotion with, uh, with the Democrats at the moment. And I don't think it necessarily is going to result in the kind of currency they're hoping for. Although you never know. Um, That's true. But you know, my interest in America right now is the crazy people with guns in the forest. I want to know what they're going to do next, right? <laughs> I don't really care about the politicians because they don't do much anyway. If you look at the Senate, if you look at the House, mm. all of their bills are all like stacked up on each other and nothing is moving and it never moves essentially. Yeah. But the people, the crazy people with the guns, I want to see what they do next and what they're talking about because they seem to surprise the, the intelligence agencies of America right now. And so I want to see if they like topple the whole thing and shoot everyone. <laughs> now there's too many people to shoot. They, 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 they've got more the guns of, in the hands of officials than the rest of the world combined. <laughs> no, no, they have more guns. The number of guns in America that have been sold outnumber the number of the number of people in the country. Yeah, no, that's and so also true. There are enough guns to kill everyone in that country, maybe twice. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Um, further afield, though, uh, th- there are obviously there are, there are lots of things going on in Britain which are worthy of, of of note. But mostly, do you think Boris Johnson is going to stand any chance of being reelected? And if he is, is it just because the Labour Party is so unpalatable? to most Britons at the moment, that even though Boris has been, you know, ham-fisted in everything that he's done in respect of managing the pandemic and lockdown after lockdown after lockdown, changes in policy mid midway, the guy is not popular, but he's still more popular than anything that the Labour Party can offer up, right? No, I, 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 I want to push back on that. I think that um, uh, Boris Johnson was part of a team that made a very important and big bet on a vaccination program early on, uh, the fruits of which uh, both Britons and South Africans are getting to enjoy. And it was a risky bet. Uh, He will be rewarded for that bet in time. I think that the UK has had a a very poor showing given how wealthy it is and given how sophisticated its its national health service is supposed to be uh, in dealing with the plague. At the same time, there's... Time is on his side. It's going to be difficult for Labour to try and force a snap election. Uh, and short of that, he's got several more years. I mean, he's got like another four years, I think, before he has to have another election. In that time, the economy, one can reasonably expect, will rebound, uh, will boom, basically, um, if nothing else, just going off the back of, of the shrinkage that it's had, as mm. well as being able to say, look, here's what I did. I fulfilled the promise of the people, the mandate of the people. I got Brexit done. Uh, I think the the world's trade is going to be uh, dislocated. I mean, it has been dislocated, so there's going to be opportunities uh, for growth there that I think a lot of uh, British companies will be better able to take advantage of because of Brexit, um, which I was against at the beginning. But I think a lot of Britons who are against it are like, at least he got it over and done with. And if there is economic reward, they will be able to look to that and say, Okay, this is great. So I think that I think that the UK is in uh, a stable enough position that it will vote material consequences. And if the material consequences in a few years' time are strong, I think they'll look back at this period and they'll say, "Wow, this was very difficult time. Uh, the government was back and forthing. It was maybe overdoing it. Uh, uh, Johnson definitely made a couple of mistakes, but 
uh, in the long run, we're glad that we stuck it out. We're glad that we stuck together. And let's pat him on the head with a re-election on the basis of the fact that our material circumstances are better now than they were. That's, that's okay. uh, I think, a plausible scenario. All right. Well, you've, you're, you're much more generous than, than I was. And, and perhaps you make a couple of valid points there. I mean, he has got, you know, the, the long-awaited Brexit has finally happened, regardless of every kind of opposition to it. So I suppose that at least deserves a little bit of credit. Um, Lito, do you have a uh, last word on anything European or particular to Britain? Uh, but I, I think Boris is not just going to win because he's done all of these great things, but because his opposition is trash. If, if you're basically the best juggler in the circus, even though the knife is in your shoulder that you've been juggling, you're better than the guy with the chainsaw in his head. So <laughs> that's basically what's happening. Right? So it's very think, vivid. <laughs> I think I think um I think Boris is just going to to slide because even no matter what he does he's always going to be better than Labour in, in, in so the Labour Party has not even like made an attempt to rebuild itself so you know, what then what are we going to 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 vote in the mess and the riffraff or are we just going to stick with the guy who is although clownish is still doing a better job than that. Wow. I mean, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed is king, huh? Of course. And I think um, Boris is a great one-eyed king. And he embraces it. I think that's the other thing that the British like about him, is that he doesn't like he doesn't pretend to have like two eyes and, and a good step. He fumbles all over himself. He loses his one eye sometimes. And then when he gets it back, he says, look, I've got it back. And so people get happy. And so I think Lita. that's... You are on fire today, man. I mean, <laughs> some of the best analysis I've ever heard. <laughs> Boris is a great one-eyed king. He actually is, though, if you think about it. And, you know, I think the, the best one-eyed king is the one who admits he's, he's got one eye in his back. Yeah. And so at yeah. times when he fumbles, you feel a little sympathy for him. Um, yeah, instead of the guy who, who pretends to be the, the leader who's to be winking. Together, but then, yeah. Yes. And and falls apart at every wind that comes, and you're like, how? Oh, but guy, you said you're a strong man. The guy who says I can't dance, I have one eye. When he falls, you say, ah, guys. But he said he doesn't know how to do. It. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, this is what people come here for, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Um, this has been terrific. The Burning Platform, as always, brought to you by Nando's. My guests this morning, uh, Lito and Doba and Gabriel Krauser. Thank you both so much for your time and for your expertise. I know that you spend many busy days doing a lot more uh, academic and and uh, and and probably quite quantitative and qualitative analysis, which we don't always get to hear. In, in the swathes that it deserves in, in terms of time. But uh, I appreciate you being here this morning and thank you for your contribution. Thank you for having me, Gary. Thanks, Good Lito. Day. Thanks, Gabriel. Thanks, guys. Wow. Um, well, if that doesn't give you some stuff to think about this morning, uh, then I don't know what will. The Burning Platform, every week on cliffcentral.com, brought to you by Nando's. Your